be um, talking about highlights from the 2022 Colorado legislative session. Um, so the General Assembly considered a total of 657 bills this year. Um, about roughly half of those ended up passing and Violence Free Colorado tracked 42 of those. Of those 42, about 20 of them were ones that we supported and fortunately the majority of those that we were supporting passed. Um, just some broader context about this session, as has been the case for a few years now, the Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the Governor's Office. And you can see just a breakdown there of the, the parties, um, number of each party in each chamber. Um, so that, you know, going in impacted some expectations we had about the session, um, as well as the fact that it is an election year. So we expected some big um, pushes um, from Democrats on their agenda. Um, as often happens, as the minority party, um, one of the tools that is available to the Republicans is engaging in some procedural slowdowns. So doing, thing, doing things like asking for bills to be read at length, to just slow down the work that the legislature is, is getting done um, and prevent some of those bills that they didn't want to see pass from moving forward. Um, we also saw some pretty big disagreements uh, within parties around things like uh, public safety and a lot of compromises often between um, Democrats in the legislature and the governor's office. One of the unique things about this year as an election year is that uh, the makeup of the legislature is going to be quite different um, in 2023 because of redistricting that has been happening. Um, so next year, at least about a quarter of legislators will be brand new. And that's because of a combination of things like term limits and um, that redistricting. Some legislators were um, drawn out of the district that they represent, so they can't represent it anymore. Some are running for higher office. Um, and a few people are just not running for re-election. So we'll see a lot of changes next year and that you know, impacted um, the desire to push and get a lot done because some people wouldn't be coming back, um, as well as potential change of control of different chambers. With that redistricting, the broad expectation is that Democrats will retain control of the House um, and most likely the governor's office and also most likely the Senate, but if anything changes, um, it would be the Senate. Um, so that, um, you know, led to Democrats trying to push through a lot of their priorities now as well. Um, fortunately, a lot of our priorities at Violets Free Colorado um, tend to be bipartisan, and they were for the most part this year. So we didn't have to deal as much with um, some of that controversy and delay tactics um, in trying to get our priorities through. One of the um, main focuses for everyone this year was American Rescue Plan Act funding. So this is funding that was provided to Colorado by Congress to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in 2022, lawmakers had over two and a half billion dollars to spend. Um, so they passed more than three dozen bills that spend ARPA funding in a variety of ways. Um, a lot on things like housing and behavioral health and workforce development, uh, paying down unemployment insurance debt. And our main goal coming into the session was really convincing the legislature to direct some of that money to specifically be used for domestic violence programs. And that comes from to what we've heard from from all of you and your programs about the impact of COVID, the um, increased demand, the increased complexity of cases, um, impacts on other funding sources, and knowing that um, more funding was needed uh, from the state to address that. So this is um, just a quick little overview of what ARPA funding looked like coming into the session. Um, the state in total has received almost $4 million. And we were focused on a few different funds um, around economic recovery, behavioral health, and affordable housing. Last year, we passed a bill um, 
that provided some funding for survivors of for programs that serve survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and other crimes. And so we wanted to do more of that. And we also were doing a lot of advocacy before the session to some task forces that were formed um, to decide how to spend money on behavioral health and affordable housing. So we were trying to get some money from, from those pots as well. And this is what we ended up with Senate Bill 183, Crime Victim Services, um, which secured another $48 million um, for programs that work with survivors and um, other crimes. So it's not all specific to domestic violence. This is, in the end, um, not as quite as much as we were hoping for. And unsurprisingly, it turns out, you know, even though it's was millions, billions of dollars. There are a lot of different parties that are advocating for that money and a lot of demand for that money. So there were times during session when we were worried that we might not get anything. So we were happy to at least be able to come out with this 48 million. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the bulk of that 38 million will be going to um, the Department of Criminal Justice that is um, going to backfill VOCA. And just, um, again, the funding stuff gets a little bit confusing, but to give a little bit of background on this VOCA situation, um, VOCA is federal funding that comes to the states and it's funded by fines and fees that are paid in federal criminal cases. And over the past four or five years, the amount of money that states have received from VOCA has decreased dramatically. And programs that currently receive VOCA funding, um, we're looking at about a 40% cut in the next funding cycle. So we were able to take some of this ARPA funding and um, backfill that anticipated um, hole, that gap in funding, which you know doesn't it doesn't help us necessarily create new programming or um, meet that additional need, but it helps to prevent programs from having to close or cut staff or things like that. Um, one of the unique pieces of this was that the majority of it um, did come from ARPA funding, but the, um, there was an additional 6 million that came from the general fund. And the general fund is just the general state budget. It's the um, money that the legislature gets to decide how to spend every year. And up to this point, we have not had any general fund money that has been dedicated to victim services, which most states do. And so it has been something that we have wanted to see change for a long time. Um, so we were excited to see that this year. It is one time, so it's not ongoing, but we did get some money from from the general fund and hope to leverage that in the future to advocate for more money from the general fund and money on an ongoing basis. Um, this um, part of the funding will be awarded to programs that have um, already applied for VOCA funding, um, the, the current grant process. Uh, beyond that, we also got six million that will be going to DVP, which is the domestic violence program uh, in the Department of Human Services. Um, for anyone who's not aware, this is the um, state program that allocates um, a different piece of federal funding we've received. So FIPS of funding we received from the federal government goes to DVP and they distribute that to domestic violence programs. So they got $6 million from the Behavioral and Mental Health Cash Fund that is specifically for community-based domestic violence and sexual assault organizations. It does not have to specifically be used on behavioral health sources. Um, the language in the bill is uh, quite broad. It just has to fit under allowable uses of ARPA funding. Um, and then more information on that money um, and requests for proposals and applications that will be forthcoming from, excuse me, from DPP. Um, third, $3 million will be going to um, backfill Vail. This came from um, advocacy from district attorneys. So this is money that will go to judicial districts um, to um, 
to fund um, really to backfill losses in bail funding because that has also decreased during the pandemic. And then lastly, a million dollars will go to CDPHE to their Community Crime Victims Grant Program. This is a program that was um, created by the legislature in 2018 to reach um, crime victims from historically underserved populations, um, primarily people of color. And so that will get another million dollars also from the general fund. Um, and again, just emphasize this is all money that um, because it's from ARPA, it's temporary. It has to be spent or encumbered by the state by the end of 2024. So meaning it has to be, not that it all has to be spent by the end of 2024, but it, there has to be an assigned purpose for it. Like it has to be in a contract or something like that. And then my understanding still until we hear something different is that it has to be spent by programs by the end of 2026. So it will last for a few years, um, but it's not a permanent ongoing source of funding. And just a few other provisions from this same bill um, beyond the funding aspects. The, um, the bill allows DBP to fund sexual assault programs on an ongoing basis. Previously, they've only funded domestic violence program, but now we'll be able to do both. It also um, updated the definition of domestic violence and the statute related to DVP. Now, this is um, this doesn't change the criminal definition. This doesn't change anything related to civil protection orders. Um, it just changes the definition in the statute around like what DVP funds. Um, the old definition in there was, I think, from the 80s, and it was focused on um, physical violence and physical injuries and talked about um, acts that were committed against a relative or someone living in the same domicile. So it really wasn't in line with, you know, the work we're doing, the work that um, DBP is funding. So that's just been updated and now refers to um, acts or patterns of behavior. It mentions physical, sexual, mental, or emotional abuse to control another individual and specifically mention someone who is or was in an intimate relationship. So it's just aligning that definition and statute with the work that um, your programs are all doing. It also um, added language defining culturally specific programs, um, as well as a definition for the first time in statute um, of teen dating violence. This again isn't criminal definition. It is only related to the statute about funding and what DVP funds, but um, it is the first time we've had that definition in statute and it's similar to the definition of domestic violence, talks about patterns of behavior and various forms of abuse and control um, for people who are under one or both are under 18 and in a dating relationship. Um, it also adds new language around um, tribal coalitions and state coalitions. Um, we don't have currently a tribal coalition in Colorado, but if we were to, it adds language allowing DVP to contract with the tribal coalition as well as state coalitions like Violence for Colorado and CICASA. And lastly, it adds some language around equity. Um, a lot of bills will have what's called a legislative declaration, which is uh, part of the bill that is not like legally binding, but is meant to be a statement of intent, really, of, um, of what the legislature wants the bill to do. And so there was language added in legislative declaration just recognizing the disproportionate impact of um, domestic violence, sexual assault, other crimes on marginalized communities. It also added some reporting requirements for the funders um, around this ARPA funding and including some aggregate demographic data in their annual reports. Um, and I will just pause really quick to see if there's questions on any of that so far. I don't see anything in the chat though. Oh, and Nancy, I see your comment about COVID. I have tested negative, so it's not COVID, just a cold, but thank you for your concern. Okay, but if there's no questions on that, I will keep going. Okay, 
Um, these are some, as I mentioned, the legislature passed uh, a lot of bills about ARPA funding. These are a few that may be um, relevant to your programs, that may be opportunities for additional funding. They are not specific to domestic violence, but they are related to um, mostly behavioral health and housing. Now, this is just um, a little summary. I have here the information in the right column about what it funds that is not comprehensive. Some of these bills have pages of different purposes, but I just wanted to highlight some, some relevant pieces. So the first bill, 1281, this is a behavioral health grant program. It will be distributed by the Behavioral Health Administration which is actually a brand new administration that was created uh, by the legislature this year. And it, um, the information in the bill about what it can fund is really pretty broad. It's evidence-based services along the behavioral health care continuum. It can include things like prevention, treatment, crisis services, recovery, harm reduction, care navigation, uh, trauma recovery, trauma-informed training, training on providing services in a culturally responsive manner, um, transitional housing, et cetera. So there are a lot of um, different pieces there. I will say for all of these, um, you know, actual policies and procedures and guidelines, um, that is all forthcoming. There aren't available applications at this point in time. Um, and we don't know exactly when those will be available, but Violence Free Colorado will, will share that information as it does become available. Um, 1281 also has language about um, funding the expansion of behavioral health care treatment for children, youth, and families. Um, and then, yeah, other pieces that aren't as relevant around like specific behavioral health outpatient services. Um, 1304 is related to housing and um, falls under the jurisdiction of the Department of Local Affairs as to the rest of them. And this one also very broad, lots of different things that it can fund. Um, some are related specifically to like infrastructure and building affordable housing. Um, but I wanted to highlight in particular that it includes the provision of time-limited rental assistance for households disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic um, who are at risk of losing their home. Um, and that includes for breach, housing navigation assistance, and legal services. Then 1356, this one is not specific to a purpose like housing or or behavioral health, but it's really intended to support small community-based nonprofits who have been economically impacted by the pandemic. Um, so the max grant amount for this one is only $100,000, and it can be no more than 30% of the organizational budget. So it really is for those smaller organizations. Um, what it can cover is um, pretty broad. It can fund infrastructure and capacity building purposes. So things like data technology needs, professional development, um, strategic planning, and existing program expansion, development, or evaluation. There is a requirement with this one that the organization demonstrate that they have been economically impacted by COVID in some way. Um, and there are a list of various ways that that could be demonstrated. It can be a decrease in um, percentage of operating expenses, um, but the organization had to close for a period or lay off staff or use financial reserves to pay for operating costs. There are a variety of different ways that could be demonstrated. And then lastly, House Bill 1377, this is another one related to housing and homelessness. And that again has a long list of things that are eligible for funding, but I specifically wanted to highlight um, emergency shelter and transitional housing are included in this one. Um, and this one does include a uh, match requirement. So again, that's just, uh, just want this to be on everyone's radar. More information will be forthcoming. Any questions on those?
and is talking to you about funding. It's not the most exciting thing, but okay. Okay, so moving beyond the funding bills, the money. Um, <laughs> Um, another bill that we worked on was Senate Bill 100, which is related to the statewide domestic violence fatality review board. Um, towards the beginning of this session this year, someone realized that if we didn't pass a bill, the review board would end in September of this year, and we didn't want to see that happen. Um, so we passed this bill that extends the fatality review for another five years and then creates a sunset process, which is kind of a, a review process that I'll talk about a little bit more with the next bill. Um, when this, when the board was created, the legislation um, around it requires it to, you know, collect and review and analyze data around the state um, related to homicides that are related to domestic violence. And they publish a report each year. They make recommendations about policy changes to the legislature um, and identify um, things like trends in those cases. So this will continue that work. And this bill also added a few new responsibilities for the board. And that was focused on things like providing training and technical assistance to local governments and local communities who would like to develop their own review teams. Um, doing outreach to those local communities with a focus on underserved and rural communities, and also developing some best practices for data collection. With those increased um, or those additional responsibilities, we um, were also able to get an increased appropriation, meaning more money for the review board. Um, it was not quite as much as we had hoped. We were hoping it would be enough to fund a full staff person to continue to work on this board, um, but it will um, provide some additional funding and resources for the board. That was one of the things that I really heard in talking to people who had, who had done work around this is that it's important work and we don't have enough resources. So fortunately, we were, were able to get some more money um, for this work going forward. Then next, we have House Bill 1210, which was the sunset for the Domestic Violence Offenders Management Board. So sunsets are basically a process we have in Colorado where certain um, regulatory agencies or divisions or boards, often they are related to a specific pro profession, will go through what's called a sunset process every few years. And in this process, um, DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, will review the entity to determine if regulation should continue and um, make any suggested changes. And then that those recommendations go to the legislature um, and there will be a bill about it. So this often happens um, you know, like there was one a couple of years ago related to dental hygienists or um, different professions like that. But this one was related to the Domestic Violence Offender Management Board, which oversees offender treatment providers in Colorado. Um, so the, the recommendations um, that were sent to the legislature were um, pretty simple and straightforward. They wanted to um, have another sunset process in 11 years. Um, institute some requirements about reviewing a certain percentage of treatment providers every year, and then also just make some logistical changes to the fingerprinting process. Sometimes with sunset processes, um, the legislature will pretty much just move forward with the recommendations and it just goes smoothly and is what everyone expects, and then sometimes it does not go as smoothly. Um, and this was a situation in which during uh, hearings in the early parts of the session, um, some legislatures the legislature um, raised some concerns and wanted to make some additional changes. So some of that included um, thinking that 11 years was too long for the next sunset, the next review process, um, which is quite a bit longer than they usually are. Um, there were also some concerns around the fact that there aren't currently a lot of compliance reviews um, and then success numbers for the most serious offenders. 
and some providers who are failing compliance reviews. So there were changes made to this one uh, before I passed. The next um, review of the DVOMB will be in 2027, so just in five years. Um, and then there were amendments to require the board to develop and implement a data collection plan prior to January of 2023 and to also start producing an annual report and they outline a variety of things that need to be in that report, such as how many people received treatment in the previous year, how many successfully completed it, um, number of treatment providers, number of treatment providers who um, applied and information about best practices and any recommendations that the board has for legislation. So that is what happened with the Sunset Domestic Violence um, Under Management Board. So it will um, have, oh, and also, sorry, they will be required to review 10% of treatment providers every two years. Um, and then we'll go through the same process again in, in five years and see if any more changes need to be made. So the pause for questions real quick on those couple of minutes. Um, so the next one I wanted to mention um, is Senate Bill 150, which was related to missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. This was a bill that um, really came about because of advocacy from the Indigenous community and concerns about insufficient response from the state related to these cases. Um, it creates a new office within the Department of Public Safety. It's an office of liaison for missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. And there are various different um, goals of this new office and some requirements for the Department of Public Safety. The intent is really to improve responses to these cases. Um, and there are requirements for the Department of Public Safety to assist with missing Indigenous persons investigations and homicide cases, to provide technical assistance um, and work with law enforcement to conduct um, some case reviews and promote interagency coordination between state, federal, and tribal law enforcement, the FBI, agency tribal liaisons, et cetera. Um, there will be, um, they will work on training for both law enforcement and the public. And actually starting in 2023, law enforcement training will be required to include information on missing and murdered indigenous people. They will also provide support for family members to work around increasing public awareness. There will be a dashboard on the Department of Public Safety's website with information and also an annual report to the legislature. And the Colorado Bureau of Investigation um, is required to, when there is a case that involves a member of a federally recognized tribe, they're required to notify tribal entities and also issue alerts. So this bill ended up not being exactly um, what was hoped for in the beginning. There were some um, provisions originally also around information sharing because one of the concerns has been that family members just don't get updates and don't get information on these cases. So that was unfortunately removed. And there were also some adjustments and amendments that give um, more control of some of these requirements to the Department of Public Safety overall, rather than the office specifically. Um, and that was to avoid the bill um, really being vetoed. So it's not exactly what was hoped for. And um, it still does retain most of the original goal um, and is a step in the right direction of Colorado actually recognizing that more needs to be done to respond to these cases appropriately. Next up is a bill about mandatory reporters. And I will start off just by saying that this, um, that at this point in time, there are no changes that impact how you approach mandatory reporting. Originally, the hope with this bill was that there would be some um, clarity around timelines for reporting and responsibilities of an individual versus the organization they work for in reporting and what happens when more than one person received information that warrants a report. Um, turns out uh, all of that is very complicated to figure out and there are a lot of stakeholders with a lot of different opinions. So at this point in time, um, the bill didn't make 
any actual changes in those areas, but created a task force that will um, consider those issues and make recommendations to the legislature. A couple of the pieces that we were working on and hoping to see change um, before it turned into just a task force bill was having some additional time for people who are safety planning with survivors to report. Um, originally, the bill said it was 24 hours, and we got language in there saying 72 hours if you're safety planning. Um, and then because of some pushback on that, we actually started having conversations about removing community-based advocates from the list of mandatory reporters. So those are things that at this point in time are not happening, but will be discussed by the task force. Um, that task force has to be formed by January of 2023, and then we'll submit a report to the legislature by January of 2025. So these are not changes that will be happening in the immediate future, uh, but down the, down the road. And um, both Violence Free Colorado and CICASA are applying to be on that task force, um, and we expect that we'll be on that task force. I've pulled out, this is not um, a complete list of things that the task force will work on and consider, but I pulled out a few that are most relevant um, to advocates. One is what the definition of immediately is. Current statute says the mandatory reporters have to report immediately, but it's not really clear what that means. So what the definition of that is and then how reporting time frames might affect mandatory reporters from different professions, specifically uh, mandatory reporters who are creating safety plans um, with victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. We did find um, that there was fortunately like receptiveness to some of these suggestions and ideas that there should be um, some exceptions and some consideration for, um, for survivors and that reporting immediately might not actually always be the most safe um, choice for that survivor. So again, nothing changing right now, but we did um, see some receptiveness to those ideas. They will also consider um, what mandatory reporting requirements are in cases of teen dating violence or cases of sexual assault um, when both parties are youth. And then also whether mandatory reporters should report incidents observed outside of their professional capacity because um, that is also kind of a gray area currently. Um, any, just going to pause again for any questions on this. Um, it's a little bit of a disappointment that we didn't get some changes now, but hopefully that will still be coming down the line with the work of the task force. Okay, next is the Reproductive Health Equity Act, which was passed this year really um, because of concerns around threats to the right to abortion at the federal level, which we, of course, since then have seen um, come to pass with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So I think the really the main takeaway here is that abortion is still legal in the state of Colorado. Um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade has not immediately changed anything here. Um, what this law did was codify in state law um, the right to, excuse me, make reproductive health care decisions free from government interference. So that includes access to contraception. That includes um, being able to choose to continue a pregnancy or to have an abortion. And it also has language around um, fetuses not having independent rights in state law. Um, I think really probably the biggest impact that we um, will see is because of our location and the states around us, I expect that providers in Colorado will see increased demand and we will see more out of state travel to Colorado to access abortion care. Um, a lot of states around us either had trigger laws in place, um, making abortion illegal or there's uh, some uncertainty around long-term legality, um, what that will look like. So I expect that we will, we will see more demand here and we will see more travel here. Um, and I have not actually been the one uh, working on this, so I don't know if you, um, if you want to jump in, Roshan, but there have been some conversations and some work around um, making some connections to provide training 
um, for all of you on this issue and what you may be seeing and what this will look like in Colorado going forward. And then just a couple of additional bills that I wanted to mention. Um, 1288, the intention here is um, making it more possible for sex workers to reach out for help if they have been a victim of a violent crime or um, have witnessed um, or are helping someone who's been a victim of a violent crime from, from being charged with prostitution. So it provides immunity from prostitution charges to someone who is seeking help from law enforcement or the 911 system or a medical provider um, if evidence of the charge of prostitution was obtained as a result of the person seeking assistance. Um, the crimes or offenses that are included here, um, there's a full list in the bill, but it includes things like murder, manslaughter, um, first, second, and third degree assault, kidnapping, sexual assault, unlawful sexual contact, human trafficking, stalking, etc. So the intention here is just to make it um, so that sex workers can actually still access help without being charged with a crime. Can I just peeking at the chat? Oh yes, thank you, Roshan. So there's um, work happening to put together a, a panel um, with local abortion rights organizations and more will come. And to let us know if you have specific questions. Um, Senate Bill 49 um, made some changes to the Victim Rights Act, and I am not going to dive into a ton of detail here because I kind of defer to Rocky Mountain Victim Law Center on that. This is really um, one of their areas of expertise, but I did want to mention it and mention a few of um, the major changes. Um, it does add two new crimes to the VRA, and those are first degree arson and criminal invasion of privacy. And then it adds um, language about um, new rights for victims, including things like being able to appear in person, phone, or virtually for all critical stages of the criminal justice process, um, having the right to be informed if a district attorney grants early termination to an offender who's participating in diversion and the date of termination. Um, it requires that the court provides translation or interpretation services as needed during all critical stages um, and some additional pieces. Um, victim has a right to receive an, an explanation from the prosecution of the possibility that the defendant may not serve their entire sentence due to good time credits and um, requires the defendant to be present during the sentencing hearing to hear the victim impact statement unless they're excluded by the court. Um, RMVLC, Rocky Mountain Victim Law Center, they are working on making updates to their VRA pocket guide um, with all of the details about this. They, um, I know, have already been providing some training and will continue to on these updates in detail. Um, so you are aware of all of them, but I wanted to make sure everyone um, knew about that. And then lastly, Senate Bill 57. This is another one that doesn't make changes immediately, but creates a task force. And the role of this task force is to develop a plan for a pilot program that will um, screen people who have, who have experienced violent crimes for um, brain injuries. So the, um, there aren't a lot of details yet that will all be worked out by the task force, but they'll work out you know, where the pilot program is going to um, be hosted. There's been some discussion about DA's offices. Um, what that screening will look like, what support will look like, um, who the um, patients will be referred to for, for follow-up care, how that will be paid for, all of those things remain to be um, determined. But the task force has to submit a plan by January of 2023, so that one will be coming up more quickly. And... And I practice this took more time, but uh, we're coming to the end here. <laughs> um, as far as um, what next, um, there is more information about all of these bills and, um, and all of the bills that the legislature worked on just on the legislature's website. And actually, since we have a little bit of time, I want to just share how exactly to look those up. 
Um, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing really quick and pull up that website. And share that. Okay, can we see the general, the legislature website right now? Okay, great. So to like see more detail about any of these bills, um, it's just leg.colorado.gov and say you wanna learn more about our funding bill, you can just go type in the number. If my internet will cooperate, okay. taking a second. Okay, and then see the full bill text, the past version of the bill, um, as well as just a, a tip. Sometimes reading bills, language is hard to follow sometimes. Um, fiscal notes tend to have a summary that is easier to understand. So that will be on the bill page as well. It just provides a summary of the legislation. Um, and then additionally, on our website, On our policy page, you can see our 2022 full legislative session report. Um, that also, I believe, is going out in our newsletter that was sent out today, I believe. Um, and this has some additional information, both about um, kind of what happened in the legislative, legislative session overall, um, as well as all of the bills that Violence Free Colorado followed. If you scroll down to Violence Free Colorado Session Summary, you can look at our bill tracker and see all of the bills that, that we monitored or supported or opposed and what happened to each of those because there were, as I said, 42 and I just picked some highlights today that were the most relevant. Sorry for your patience as I just switch back over. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can learn more at both of those websites. Um, we also have um, public policy committee that I know many of you are already aware of um, that meets on the second Wednesday of each month at noon via Zoom. Um, if anyone is interested in joining in um, in our policy work. And you can also join our um, action alerts list, which is not a list where you're going to you know, receive like emails every week, but during the legislative session when we um, need support from the community, reaching out to legislators, asking them to um, support a certain bill, or um, also federal work that we do, um, we will send out action alerts around you know, recently it's been reauthorizing VAWA and things like that. So, you can um, sign up for those as well, and um, you'll receive these slides and the link um, is right there on that slide to sign up for that. Um, as far as following up with other questions, um, I have put the general info line for Violence Free Colorado or email here um, because um, this is actually my second to last day of Violence Free Colorado. So if you have questions this afternoon or tomorrow, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but after that, um, you will be in good hands with Roshan, our associate director, and also um, Monica, our new executive director. We're going to be overseeing um, public policy work um, uh, while we hire a new policy director. Um, and with that, I want to just open it up to see if there are any questions. I know that was just me talking to, at you for a while about some technical things. Um, but I'm just gonna hop to my thank you slide and see if there are any other questions. Um, and so thanks, Amelia. I'm, I'm sorry, this is for Shannon. I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna just let everyone know, one know that we're gonna stop recording now. So feel free to ask questions. They won't be a part of the recording. Um, and everyone um, is able to jump in and talk. You just need to unmute to do so. So if you have questions, now is the time. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. 